Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second talk of Plants Beyond Empire, which is a mini series of discussions organized as part of the ongoing Formations Program. The Formations Program is led by the Postcolonial and Global Studies Research Group in collaboration with Bonington Gallery. The series foregrounds the work of underrepresented writers, intellectuals, and activists worldwide who address inequalities of all kinds often bringing people from different places um, and working practices together for important conversations. My name is Kat Massing and I'm delighted to be involved in the Plants Beyond Empire series, which looks at different artists, create uh, a different artists, creative, intellectual and community initiatives around plants within histories of empire, colonialism, agriculture and extraction. This week, I will be joined by Dan Redding, um, the Head of Engagement and Learning at Birmingham Botanical Gardens, Emily Hazel, the Director of Horticulture and Curation at Birmingham Botanical Gardens, and Charlie Gregson, Senior Lecturer um, in Museum and Heritage Development at NTU, to talk about a collaborative project, planting stories and diversifying storytelling with Birmingham Botanical Gardens. We expect our conversation to last around an hour in total. Um, this will include a short talk from me, um, a screening of a film produced by NTU Animation students as part of the project, and a discussion between Jen, Emily, Charlie and myself about the different approaches to the project. Um, at any point, point during the talk or discussion, we invite you to send questions to us either via the chat um, on YouTube here or by sending me an email to formations at ntu.ac.uk um, and we will post audience questions at the end. So um, just um, to remind you again, it's if you want to send me an email, it's formations at ntu.ac. Um, .ac.uk. Um, so before we get started with the presentation, I'm just going to let everyone introduce themselves um, because I think it's helpful to understand the different angles um, we're coming from, particularly when asking questions. So I'm just going to hand over to Jen, um, Charlie and Emily, maybe starting with Jen. Hello, thanks Kat. So I'm Jen Ridding and I'm Head of Engagement and Learning at Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Shall I go next? So uh, I'm Charlie Gregson. I'm a Senior Lecturer in Museum Studies at NTU. Um, and I suppose it's worth saying that I'm coming at this project um, from a practice based background um, as a former relationship manager for Arts Council England um, with creative media um, and working with audience development um, as director of a heritage consultancy. Uh, so my angle of interest is co-production, working with communities and creating space for that dialogue between uh, higher education staff, um, community organisations and students and uh, really creating those employability um, and creative opportunities. Hi, I'm M Hazel. I'm everything horticulture and the people with the plants as well at Birmingham Botanical Gardens. I actually come from a community gardening background and I went into botanical horticulture at Kew Gardens about four or five years ago. And here I am in Birmingham. So that's my background and maybe explain some of the takes that I have. Perfect. And I probably should also say I'm also a senior lecturer in museums and heritage development at um, NTU. Um, and I'm quite interested in holistic approaches to safeguarding landscape and thinking around ways museums and other institutions can engage um, communities with anthropocenic changes. Um, so before I'm introducing the project, I think it's worth saying that we're really very much at the beginning of the project. Um, so we haven't had any community um, workshops yet, and that's partly because of the time of the year. Um, and the project is also quite exploratory. Um, so we really welcome any kind of comments or questions um, you may have. Um, it's a one year project that is funded by NTU's Innovative Knowledge Exchange Fund. And in terms of outcomes, I think it's quite a low stakes project in the sense that it's really more about 
building relationships with different communities and piloting interpretation. So it really gives us the freedom to try things out um, and see how things work. The aim of the project is to work and collaborate with communities in Birmingham and visitors to Birmingham Botanical Gardens to produce pilot and to diversify the stories that are currently being told in the garden. Um, communities will be involved through different artist interventions. Um, so, for example, one of the artists we are working with is um, Sarajit Birdie, and I think we have a link to his work. Um, has been working with communities at Winterbourne House um, in Birmingham, and is quite passionate about drawing plants and does lots of has a lot of experience with working with um, communities and organizing workshops. And um, the results will then be exhibited in a project lab setting. Um, in the gardens exhibition space over June. And we, and I have to say mainly Charlie, um, also have been working with students um, to bring out some of the plant journeys in the gardens through archival research. And we're also still thinking about how we can engage communities with the gardens archive. So um, I'm just going to start by telling you a little bit more about this, telling you a little bit more about the site and the current interpretation. Um, and then I'll reflect a bit on decolonization in botanical gardens, which in a way is where this project has its roots. Um, and then I'll say a bit more about what we're doing and why. Um, so Birmingham Botanical Gardens, and I think Alex has a website, um, was founded in 1829 and opened in um, to the public in 1832 and its establishment was very much linked to a growing interest of the middle class in botany which was encouraged by the introduction of new plants to Britain through colonial expansion. Um, it was designed by G.C. Luden, or Luden um, a leading garden planner, horticultural uh, um, journalist and publisher and the initial co um, collection was established with gifts of plants and seeds from similar institutions and botanic gardens. Um, its original onset was um, scientific study, it was about the study of botany and horticulture, but then financial problems in 1846 um, changed the focus um, on uh, kind of more ornamental features to attract more subscribers. And then for the same reason, there was a zoological collection added in 1910, which amongst others um, included seals, alligators, and bears. And to, um, it, has, it has a collection of over 7,000 documented species of plants, making it one of the most diverse living collections in England. Um, but there are no more animals um, in the garden, apart from Koi, and I think the birds have just been recently rehomed. So the original idea of the project came about when talking to um, Sarah Blair Manning, who's the CEO of Birmingham Botanical Gardens, about the current interpretation of the site is in need of an update as it does not really reflect the diverse audiences of the garden. Overall, current interpretation is quite dated. Um, and a new strategy is being developed as part of a capital development project um, to which this project hopefully will contribute to. Um, and Jen and Emily, I think, might be able to say a bit more about that later. Um, and Sarah has been at Birmingham Botanical Gardens in June, uh, since June 22, so for less than two years and overall is um, really a new team with lots of new additions, um, including Jen, Jen and Emily. Um, so the garden is going through a lot of changes at the moment and the team is working to update several aspects of the site. The colonial collections of the garden are evident throughout the site, for example, um, in the glass houses. So um, if we can have the first picture, please. Um, so the first picture shows the tropical glass house. Um, and if we go to the next image, um, we should see um, some of the economic plants that are in the garden. So, for ex so plants that are economically profitable, um, for example, coffee, vanilla and rubber. Um, and then the next picture shows the subtropical house, so just that you get kind of an idea of how it looks um, in the garden. Um, and one of the economic plants that can be found there is tea. 
Um, the collection of economic plants played an important role in the development of trade empires, um, partly for research um, to see how those plants could be made more profitable um, and also in the development of monocultures um, and as such um, for the British Empire, which according to um, Timothy Bernard, um, who's written a lot of around botanical gardens in Singapore, um, made botany one of the most important instruments on colonial expansion. Um, current interpretation um, does not communicate to the visitor how and why these plants were brought to Britain, acknowledge wider global entanglements, or highlight indigenous knowledge. And I'll come back to some of the exa uh, some examples of that later. Um, some of the current signage interpretation are also celebration of European plant hunters. And if we go to the next um, image, we can see the Wilson Walk, um, named after E.H. Wilson, um, who used to work for, Bonne um, for Birmingham Botanical Gardens before joining the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. And between 1899 to 1911, um, he went on four plant collecting journeys to China, which gave him the nickname Chinese Wilson. Um, so if we go to the next image, um, we can see um, the interpretation panel that reads, um, he was a very successful plant hunter and he discovered over um, 1,000 new plant species. Using words like plant hunter and discover failed to acknowledge that most plant collecting was actually done by local people who would have already been familiar with these plants. And in the next, in the picture next to the panel, we can see um, some of our Chinese students looking at the handkerchief tree, which um, Wilson brought back from his first journey um, to China. It was the purpose of his first journey really to collect the seeds, um, which um, the panel describes as dangerous. One of the reasons why um, the journey was dangerous, which wasn't mentioned, is that um, at the time Wilson was there, um, there was a box of rebellion going on in China it was more in the north, um, but still, which was around um, what was fueled by anti foreign sentiments, um, particularly um, by um, yeah, um, missionaries interfering um, in China and also um, kind of through colonial, yeah, um, colonial powers um, trading in China. Um, so and I'm sure Emily will say a little bit more about, um, well, yeah, generally the colonial roots of Birmingham Garden or generally of economic plants and as a discussion um, part. Um, so this kind of interpretation is really common in botanical gardens in the UK and has been observed um, amongst others by um, White Nielsen in the 2023 Museum Management and Curatorship article the colonial roots of botany, legacies of empire in the botanic gardens of Oxford and Kew. So while museums such as the Pitt Rivers Museum and Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery are working on decolonizing the institutions and highlighting the colonial connections to the visitor, few botanic gardens are engaging the audience so with these issues. While discussions on decolonization of botanic gardens um, and gardens in general and the need to be more inclusive and representative are taking place on the ground and in academic literature. This is not always communicated to the visitor. Decolonization work in botanic gardens also can be quite controversial. Originally, the botanic garden used um, 2021 to 2030 manifesto included a promise to decolonize their collection, which was then rephrased to re-examine after the garden felt the backlash around the word and distracted from the work they were trying to do. Despite criticism, criticism, botanic gardens are working to bring out these stories more. A recent exhibition at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh called Shipping Roots, um, I think we have a link to that, um, from March to August 2023, by the artist Cactus Souza examines movement of plants through empire 
considering how European expansion has impacted on and changed ecosystems. The project connects Australia, India and the UK, mirroring the artists' um, personal connections, looking at the intended and unintended movement, movements of plants. One of the stories highlighted in the exhibition is that of the eucalyptus, which was transported all over the world and is grown in plantations, which can have devastating environmental impacts. So the trees are highly flammable. Um, one of the questions the artist asks is, what happens when these trees are removed from the Aboriginal land they grow on and the traditional custodians who care for them? Questions around plant journeys in Birmingham Botanical Gardens, their, collect their connection to colonialism and the impact of how economic plants are grown today um, on the environment and the importance of ind indigenous knowledge are questions we are considering as part of the project. In our initial um, application, we were very much thinking about the project in terms of decolonizing. And it was a convenient shorthand to communicate our intended that area um, of focus to the funders. We had quite a structured idea around how we wanted to work with communities to co-produce new interpretation, which we thought could happen in a series of three workshops. But as the project team started to unpick the intentions of the project, and I'm paraphrasing slash quoting Charlie here, um, the term set awkwardly with the realities of the short-term pilot project. We felt that there were notions of co-opting communities into taking the burden of societal change and the danger of overstating the impact that a small um, intervention could have. There was also a question of the time commitment that was expected from participants during the workshops and the potential pressure to talk about painful histories without getting something in return. There's also more um, criticism of the idea of decolonization in museums and gardens that we felt it needed to be taken into account. So Maya Kassim, when reflecting on her role in the past is now exhibition at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, which looked at the role of Birmingham in the British Empire, wrote, decolonizing is deeper than just uh, Decolonizing is deeper than just being represented. When projects and institutions proclaim a commitment to diversity, inclusion, and decoloniality, we need to attend to these claims with a critical eye. Decoloniality is a complex set of ideas. It requires complex processes, space, money, and time. Otherwise, it runs the risk of becoming an other buzzword like diversity. In addition to that, Birmingham Botanical Gardens is also just starting to build relationships with local communities. And maybe Jen can say a little bit more about that in the discussion part. So there wasn't really an obvious group to work with. We decided to soften our approach um, to one of diversifying narratives. And we are aware that the term diversity or diversifying is also problematic, um, which would be underpinned by um, historical research done by us and the students to re reveal the entanglement of society with colonialism um, that would inform community engagement and the pilot interpretation. Um, the workshop approach was abandoned and we opted to go for something as much lower stakes that gives people the, uh, the option to spontaneously opt in if they want to without the expectation of producing something that fits our brief or our expectations. So we're putting on artist interventions on the day happening in Birmingham Botanical Garden and we're looking at different events that target different audience groups. This will be really low scale interventions within the garden where people have, will have the opportunity to draw something or write some poetry and talk about what matters to them and what stories they want to hear. So, for example, the handkerchief tree that was brought back by Wilson, um, which, which is my marketed at the moment as one of the star plants in the garden and which is very beautiful when um, in bloom didn't really excite the students from China that much. They were not really familiar with the plant. Um, the plant a lot of them cared about was um, ginkgo because that has had much more of a cultural relevance to them. So it's finding out what stories people want to hear and giving them the opportunity to tell it in different ways. 
Um, and a lot of this will ha happen with people who are already visiting um, in the gardens, but we're also working with um, Chris Pullman from General Public. And again, we have a link to that. Um, who has recently worked on a project that collected all histories from Birmingham allotment holders. So we will he will connect us to some of the allotment holders he has been working um, with who don't necessarily come to the gardens. The end product, and we don't really know what that's going to be yet, is going to be exhibited in the exhibition space in Birmingham Botanical Gardens as kind of a low um, key project lab exhibition that would give people the opportunity to add interpretation and comments if they want to. Um, the other element of the project is the staff student partnership as part of the knowledge exchange. Um, and that's where more of the historical research of the project is happening. Um, we we're thinking about how we could highlight to visitors that one of the things we are interested in is the idea of planned journeys. And one of the products we um, really liked is a film that sent us around uh, rubber. And I think we have a link to the film as well. Um, so if we can go to the next image, please. Um, so on the image, we should be able to see the interpretation of rubber that's currently um, at the gardens and it says um, the car tire plant. The milky latex is collected from cuts of this tree's bark. Um, this is refined into rubber. Into rubber, the cuts can recover um, in only one day because the latex seals the wound. Don Boy Dunlop um, patented the Airfield rubber tire. He began tire production in Birmingham in 1891, um, and this glosses over much of the more problematic history of the rubber tree, um, whose seeds were brought over from Brazil um, by Henry Wickham to Kew Botanical Gardens in an act of biopiracy in 1876. It was then distributed, distributed to other imperial botanic gardens in Singapore and Sri Lanka, for example, um, and other British colonies where plantations were established. Lila Kafshaw highlights the violent history of rubber in her film, Q's Botanical Colonialism, the story of um, Heba Brazil, uh, Basil, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, Heba um, Basinsis, um, inspired by the rubber plant at Q. Um, she uses multi-species storytelling, highlighting the entanglement between plants and humans. Um, thinking about if we could produce something similar, illustrating the journey of one of the plants in Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Our two students worked with second year animation students to produce a film on the banana, um, one variety which can be seen in the next picture. Um, and here's a current um, interp interpretation um, describes the banana as a dwarfed Cavendish banana. Um, one of the shortest banana plants. This helps to resist storm damage. It can tolerate cooler conditions. Wild bananas are found in the forest margins and openings of southeast. Bananas are a good source of carbohydrate, protein, and fiber. So in the animated film, we had tried to highlight the cultural significance of the banana much more, as well as its journey to, Bon um, to Birmingham Botanical Gardens bringing in elements of multiple voices and multiple multiple species storytelling. The film ends with asking visitors to Birmingham Botanical Gardens to reflect on their own connection um, and history with the site. Um, a lot of the research, and if we can go to the next picture, has been done by our placement students, um, Madavi, Eve and Huey, two of them um, are on um, the next pic are on the picture. Um, so I was thinking if we can show the film next and then go to the Q&A. What is the Birmingham Botanical Garden? A miniature paradise, a semi-private garden with opportunities for study and recreation not obtainable elsewhere within distance. A vibrant part of the horticultural world. By having away from the hustle and bustle of the city, a place to relax, de-stress, a legacy of empire deeply rooted in colonialism. A place to play. And my outdoor classroom. 
a home for plants and stories. These stories being told. Take the banana plant for example. This is me, the banana plant. I'm a celebrated part of Asian culture. My association with fertility and bounty, you know, music decorate the entrance to homes, weddings, religious festivals, and special occasions. I'm Kala Bao, the goddess of war and feminine energy. My name means banana lady in Bengali. During Jura Puja festival, my image is created from the banana plant and draped in yellow sari of a red border. Banana leaves provide a unique flavor and aroma to my nasi lemak and banana leaf rice. As a tough and fibrous material, many parts of the banana plant are useful in handicrafts, such as making baskets, and are used to float small rafts made from the leaves in the annual Loi Kratong festival. It's nutritious for my animals and my family. Today, I've been across the world and I've been given many names. My journey to the Birmingham Botanical Gardens has been perilous. I lived in the jungles of India, China and Southeast Asia. Over time, white men have got rich from my bounty, creating monocultures and violence with the spoils of environmental capitalism and piracy. As I grow from a rhizome, I'm a clone leaving me susceptible to disease. In the 1950s, the Grow Michael banana, bigger and more flavoursome than the Cavendish banana eaten across the world today, was wiped out by the Fusarium wilt disease. This disease has developed a new strain, now threatening the Cavendish banana. Now, across the world, the banana plant is more prevalent and eaten across many cultures. Well, how does my story feel with yours? What does it make you think about the Birmingham Botanical Gardens? Come and be a part of the ongoing story. Um, so, just um, to reinitiate as part of the Q&A, please feel free to send any questions um, or comments that you might have. Um, but I just thought while we are waiting for questions and comments, um, Charlie, do you want to expand a little bit on what you've been doing with the students? Yeah, sure. So, um, as Kat said earlier, it's a, um, a staff student partnership, um, and so we had three paid interns uh, who were supporting with the research um, and leading the, the project essentially um, through their own ideas. Um, and what was really wonderful about this was um, we, we walked into the gardens with with the students to start with and instantly one of them said, ah, oh, banana plant. You know, this is this is just like home. So she's Sri Lankan and it just instantly reminded her of home and the people she was missing and her childhood with growing up around banana trees, banana plants, I should say, as they're a herb. Um, and uh, instantly that was that was the focus of the project. Um and so that meant a lot to us of going in with that open perspective and giving space for people to work out what they were interested in. Um, and so that's how we came to pick the banana. Um, now, I was delighted in this because it's an economic crop. I was thinking, yes, you know, there's loads of um, really interesting footage on the um, colonial, colonial film archive with um, Sri Lankan um, plantations of bananas, things like that. But as we started delving into the research of the banana, the history of the banana, we realised that it actually had tons of different entry points for people. So it's such a ubiquitous fruit. You know, it's kind of an iconic sexual imagery uh, in contemporary art. We're all, we've all kind of grown up with it as a, some of our first food we've eaten. Um, it's got the association with, with planta uh, plantations and the colonial empires providing shade for coffee, cacao, pepper plants, um, you know, a cheap source of food for enslaved people on plantations. But it also has more contemporary um, problematic issues with uh, um, large scale food companies being involved in um, South American politics, um, hence where we get the phrase banana republic. Um, and there's all these sources with with the banana in Buddhist literature, um, Islamic uh, literature, Alexander the Great, you know, so it's got this really rich history that lots of people could delve into. Um, so we 
went to our level two, our level five, year two animation students. Um, and they had about eight weeks to produce that film. So <laughs> it was a really massive brief for them. Um, and we came in with the approach that it was, it's a short time frame, it's a massive topic. This was just really trying to push the boundaries for all of us on what we could do with multi-species polyphonic um, narratives. Um, and so it's this idea of rapid process hyping, and that's something that we've been really interested in with our practice at NTU is how we think about design thinking, um, how we implement a system of project management where we're handing over control and really understanding what audiences want to see from the work that we're co-producing with them. Um, and what was brilliant about working with the students was they were a fresh pair of eyes. Um, we all know the problems with um, the heritage world and the botanic garden um, or horticultural world with um, lack of diversity and staffing. Um, and our, star our student cohort is incredibly diverse. So it was a real opportunity to to have these students give their genuine perspective and contribute um, their own personal stories and cultures to, to the kind of rich story of this banana plant. Um, It's and, and it's something that we've been working with, this, this idea of thinking about personas and thinking about, well, you know, who is your target audience? And, and as students, that target audience is them. It's something we've been working with at Newstead Abbey as well, um, with, you know, our students have the best perspective on their own uh, lived experiences. So that was really, really good to bring in there. Um, and one of the things we, we were kind of thinking with this film is how do we break down that authoritarian voice, you know, the authoritative voice, you know, to start with, the animation students had um, a narrator. Um, it wasn't quite as uh, sort of cut and dry as, as the white curator does the narration because they're a very diverse group themselves. Um, but instantly we started thinking about, well, how do we tell multiple stories? And that's where that beautiful rubber plant film gave us lots of inspiration for those kind of multivocal um, stories. So, yeah, if you if you get a chance to watch that after the, um, the talk, I can't recommend it enough that was a really uh, key inspiration point for us um i can talk about the importance of pay i suppose um and and the kind of power dynamics in this partnership i don't know where whether we save that for the q a or you want me to delve into that with the partnership a bit more um we can save it for a little bit later if you want to um yeah so Maybe Jen and Emily, do you want to say a little bit more about the development at Birmingham Botanical Garden is going through at the moment? Um, and maybe I'll hand that, give that to Jen and then Emily, if you want to say something about economic plans a little bit later, that would be great. And I suppose I should I should frame it with this was what was really exciting about this project was the, because the gardens are at such an experimental part uh, point in their process. Um, with the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, development phase. Uh, yeah, working with Jen and Emily and the team, it was just, it was a really nice synchronous point when we're all kind of thinking, well, what do we do next? You know, how do we explore what we can do? Um, yeah, so, so I'll set you up for that. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about the project just to set the context. Um, so as Kat said, the gardens have been open to the public since 1832, so we're approaching nearly 200 years. And we're one of the last independent botanic gardens, and we're an independent charity as well. And that's not very widely known. So lots of botanic gardens became part of universities or local authorities or became parks. So actually, one of the last independent gardens. So I find it really interesting if anyone listening, if you know Birmingham, we're really close to the city centre. Um, we're really close to a humongous traffic island called Five Ways. Um, yet there's this what people call a miracle survival, really close to the city in huge urban sprawl, in a huge urban metropolis of the West Midlands. Um, so it's it's really unique in that sense. Um, and as Charlie said, we are in stage one of a National Lottery Heritage funded project. It's a capital project around 14 million to completely redevelop the site. And that takes a number of forms. So 
Primarily, it's about restoring the heritage we have on site. So we have four listed glass houses on site that are at risk of loss if they're not properly restored and conserved very soon. It will also be about creating completely new visitor facilities, so new entry route into the gardens. So at the moment, you have to come in through a car park and you wouldn't know there were a wonderful botanic gardens behind that car park. New visitor facilities, new welcome, new shop, new retail, new learning spaces. And then also rethinking, and Em can speak to this, around how we work with the listed landscape and the living collection, both through horticulture and through interpretation, as we're talking about today. So we're currently in stage one in the development phase. And as Charlie said, that is a really uniquely fascinating, interesting, exciting, fast paced phase of getting ready for a big capital project. So actually bringing multiple voices onto your staff team, multiple collaborators, and completely rethinking what you're doing, bringing new things to the foreground and asking lots of questions, not always knowing the answer. And we're planning to put in the stage two application in November with the decision due in spring 2025. And as we've said that many of the team are new, so it's about building a new team and with that new communities of practice as well, whether that's uh, volunteers, uh, educational partners, communities that we're working with past and present. Um, so it's a real a moment of change. And I think for me, it's just that thinking about it as a Venn diagram. It's like, what does it mean to have this botanical garden in an urban context in Birmingham, which is the most super diverse, youngest city in Europe um, in the 21st century and the fact it's still there. And if you put those things together, what does that mean and what can you do with that that perhaps is completely unique to that context and that setting? So, Emma, I don't know whether you'd like to say about a little bit more about the horticultural side of what I've said. Yeah, I can say bits about the living collections and the horticulture and, and landscape. So as Jen touched upon, we do have four listed glass houses which aren't in the greatest state of repair that will be restored as part of the capital project. Um, but within them, there's also the the plants which are there and cultivated uh, and benefit from the climates that are controlled within the glass houses generally at, to a lesser extent uh, controlled at, at the moment. After the capital project we hope that will be enhanced. And uh, one of the key questions that I'm looking into as uh, uh, you know, head of the horticultural team is what, what do we want within those glass houses after the capital capital project what plants do we want to grow and so something that I think is really great about this project is yeah seeing what plants people respond to the importance of you know the importance of those plants uh, to people socially and culturally and bringing you forward those stories because a lot of the time plants are um, justified within the collections because of their relevance to perhaps Wilson or another um, European collector from the Victorian era. And I don't think that's enough um, for today and for the future in terms of justifying those collections. Um, but on the flip side of that, what I do find really, really powerful is when people do have those reactions when they walk in and the, the plants remind them of home and allow that inter, uh, inter, inter intercontinental sharing of plant knowledge and cross-cultural sharing of plant knowledge I, I absolutely love that aspect of it so that's what we're working on for the glass houses and then in terms of the landscape management it is a grade two listed landscape and there are a large collection of plants out there as well which need to be carefully looked after too they also are from all the way around the world and it's about how we really look after those, but also succeed that planting for the next 200 years. So that Davidia in Volocrata, the dove tree or the handkerchief tree, it's, you know, it's, it's highlighted as a key element because of Wilson. But actually, I think just as a tree, it's incredibly beautiful and it's it's 
do we then want to retain that in the gardens and and where would we plant it and how would we talk about that tree in the years to come and I hope that will come out of projects such as this in terms of how we talk about it and put those plants together so yeah those those are a few things going on within the horticulture department is there anything else that you wanted me to talk about or shall I pass over um we have a question which I think is both for Jen and Emily um from Joanna Wells of the Chelsea Physics Garden who are also decolonizing and she's asking if um, BBG has faced any internal resistance or external oppositions from traditional stakeholders, funders, um, to the new interpretive approach. Do you want to go? I mean, I can talk about a little about a bit about. So sometimes um, there's a little bit of a attitude within my industry, and this is perhaps why um, it was sort of I think mentioned by Charlie horticulture can often not be a very diverse industry and particularly in botanic gardening which I found quite um, jarring when I, I joined botanic gardening is this kind of romanticization and idealization of these plant hunters uh, who were really in the thick of colonial colo colonial expeditions and at the same time as sending plants back you know people would be on those boats enslaved people and uh and all, all kinds of things as well. So, so they, they kind of, that idealization is really quite odd. And I think really positioning ourselves as that not being where we're going as a senior leadership team and questioning those narratives within my team, uh, that is the way forward. And I think the, the new horticultural team it's not representative of the city, certainly, but I think they know that that's where we're going. And I think, yeah, they're kind of, they understand it, but it is mm. a habit. It's almost like a mantra about talking about these European men and, and their importance. Um, and it will be a fine line to toe in terms of funders. And, you know, some of them really want to see that heritage piece and uh, might be particularly interested in, in funding, um, you know, someone's story in relation to their significance to Birmingham. But I think there's there's a technique and a space for for telling those stories in a way that's sensitive. Mm. Yeah, and I think just to sort of chime in there that we, we, and you touched upon it a bit, Kat, with the you know shying away from the term decolonization and it's we were thinking very carefully about what kind of language we're using and what positionality we're coming from um as researchers within those conversations because and, and the interpretive approach is still very much developing um one of our first meetings with jen you know you were talking to the new interpretation consultants that day um and that's what's kind of wonderful about this you know we can it's, it's giving a space for those conversations of okay, well, how do we tackle this? How do we bring people into that conversation? How do we recognise what we're doing here is sensitive? Um, and something we, we're we thinking about with this very early stages project is, you know, how do we give space for that kind of pastoral support as well, for staff, for for volunteers, for, for communities, um, making sure that it is a kind of holistic relationship, I suppose. Mm. Um, we're very conscious of, you know, we're, we're an all white female team in the project as well. So really recognising uh, some of those issues. Mm. Yeah, so the interpretation consultants that Charlie referenced were working with Creative Core. So um, if anyone's interested, do have a look at their work. Um, and as Charlie said, this project it's feeding into that and and wholly existing alongside that process as well which is really interesting and in a way I think that has taken the pressure off our project actually because it's not about creating formal outputs or writing a strategy at the end of this project it's about actually being able to action research and trial things on the ground to then feed into that bigger piece of formal work that is happening as part of the stage one lottery project. And I think it was interesting that going back to first principles and just thinking about the language that we use and that term decolonisation, we 
we quickly, through our first conversations, decided actually we were not able to decolonise the gardens, not through a short term project and potentially not ever, actually. Do we need a different type of vocabulary to discuss and talk about what we're doing here? Yeah, I know, I know um, uh, Chimpangoa talks about the disobedient museum. Uh, <laughs> and I just love the idea of, yeah, you, you know, being a disobedient garden, but then yeah. you know, also balancing the traditional audiences. Um, you know, you're kind of bringing people along rather than, mm. than yeah. But then, yeah, how, how can you be that? Uh, you know being radical but while also keeping that core audience happy it's a it is a difficult mm. thing that this is and this is why having those exploratory conversations is so interesting so yeah. important being radical radical with kindness and mindfulness I think and I think yeah. I love the idea of um, the disobedient museum or garden and actually the disobedient visitor and mm. I love that and one of the things I've really enjoyed is that despite the interpretation that we have on site already, which is aged, it's a hodgepodge, it's different times, different voices, it's not doing many of the things we want it to do right now. When you spend time, if we're talking about the glass houses, in those spaces and just observe how visitors engage with the material in front of them on their own terms, and they're being really wonderfully disobedient <laughs> because actually they're having many of the conversations that we're exploring through this project naturally themselves. And they don't necessarily need a label to tell them how to do that. And I just really love that. Um, and I like to think of it as, um, you know, if you see like desire lines in a path, like a field mm. and people have gone, you know what, we don't want to follow the formal path. We just want to go round this way. And so many people have done that, that it forms the new path. And I, I sometimes, you know, I see people or hear people engaging with the living collection in a way on their terms. And it's like they're creating their own desire lines through that collection. And I think as institutions, we don't always give audiences enough credit to be able to engage and interpret on their own terms and we can end up doing a lot of telling through words and we don't always necessarily need to do that. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, so we have another question from Alan, which I suppose is more for Charlie and um, asking if you could provide some more details about the partner about how the partnership between the garden and the university developed um, and perhaps where you hope the relationship might go to in the future. Um, so the partnership partly developed, um, I think, because we already knew um, Sarah from Nottingham. Um, so um, Sarah was the CEO of um, Nottingham Castle before that. Um, and then when she joined um, BBG, we just kind of had a chat about her new role um, and what she was planning to do, which all sounded really exciting, um, particularly in terms of the capital project. And we just were chatting about several things um, that the gardens were interested in, including kind of the idea around decolonizing, but then also ideas around climate change and how to bring that more to the forefront. And then when the innovative knowledge exchange um, fund came up, we just saw that as a really good opportunity um, to put something in and talk to Sarah, which would make the most sense for them. And that was the kind of diversifying storytelling um, theme. So I think one of the things that is quite um, important when it comes to those partnerships is really talking to the partner and making sure that whatever you're doing um, fits their needs. So I think sometimes in academia, you're kind of thinking a lot about what you want to do and then you're kind of trying to push that on your partner and I hope we haven't been doing that. Um, but yeah, I think it's very much about dialogue and finding out um, what works and I think we changed the project quite a lot from what we were originally intending to do because some of the things we were thinking didn't actually work like the workshops um, and I suppose that was also partly finding out from what would work and what wouldn't because when we developed the project I was also quite new to the gardens so yeah I don't know Charlie do you want to add anything about future um, relationships? Yeah 
I should also say that Sarah is an alumni of the Museum and oh, yeah. Heritage Development Masters. So maintaining those links with your alumni is <laughs> has has really helped us to grow that that kind of network as well. And and um, Sarah has been so enthusiastic about supporting the course and coming back and lecturing, um, and joining with projects like this. Um, so with you know as always it's kind of finding those really key individuals that make change happen and then and then go and hire the right teams and uh, bring all these exciting ideas to the fore um something to flag as well is 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 this kind of opportunistic looking for the grant so having been a relationship manager um you know since i was there in 2018 i think it was you know that even before that there's been an under subscription of the project fund by museums um, and so still now they're unlocking collections uh, strand of the uh, project grants is, is open for museums because they're really trying to get museums to um, and heritage sites to, to um, soak up this cash. Uh, so it's, it's kind of about spotting those opportunities and, and joining the dots together in a way. Um, and as ac academics, it, it ha we have to we have had to kind of leverage a bit of space for it, haven't we? Yeah. Um, thinking about how we can carve out some time for that sort of stuff um but those partnerships have been so important in just enriching our jobs and enriching the um the research and the student opportunities uh, and the kind of social impact of our work as well um so in terms of where we hope the relationship will go in the future uh you know this is very early stages as we said it's kind of where does it go next what you know why whether birmingham botanical gardens are in a um a space where they can uh, commit to the next stage of things you know especially as you're at such a interesting phase in development we're kind of fitting in with your time scales there um, and a particular consideration is you know if we were to go for arts council funding I know um, that's got to fit in with with whether that fits with the gardens plans for arts council funding so, so it's it's very much a kind of moving picture that keeps developing and I think something that's really interesting that we been talking with our team recently about is you know this need for time to develop those relationships um whether that's with communities with funders um with your partners um yes so that's very it's kind of a hopeful vision for the future that as academics we might get more time <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah we 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 are looking at talking to um botanic gardens uh in in other countries um thinking about how we kind of progress this this work of, of deepening audience relationships um, and kind of going from there really sharing that knowledge essentially as it's a knowledge exchange project how we then kind of share that knowledge more more widely um i don't then or emily do you want to add anything to what charlie has said in terms of uh, creating links with botanic gardens globally for bbg uh yeah, yeah i can say a, a, a little bit about that uh so I think we, well, we have an aspiration to become a BGCI accredited garden and that would be really great. BGCI are Botanic Gardens Conservation International. So they're a global network of botanic gardens. So botanic gardens across all the way across the world are, are registered with them. So that's really positive. And then in terms of links with botanic gardens and globally, I haven't quite got to that stage at the moment. I'm just linking in nationally, but certainly there are some personal contacts and other more strategic contacts that I'd like to develop in the future. Um, how it relates to the this specific project, I'm not completely sure um, if it would link into interpretation or if it would have some other outcomes. Yeah, we've been talking about the the um, breadfruit, haven't we? And, and just thinking about what other plants are on your radar, and what interesting stories could spin off from this. You know, if we've developed a methodology, we've you know got to know how to work with each other, and the importance of finding those kind of local gatekeepers, which is you know Jen's local knowledge has been um, key for that. You know thinking about what you know what's next in terms of different plants to look at as well mm. yeah and, and as we said when we started working together so I joined the gardens in August last year so I was super new as well and I'm not from the botanic garden world I'm from museum and gallery world as well so it was actually we 
we thankfully and I was very thankful and grateful for that flex it was about reshaping the project and thinking around actually the gardens we don't have a start point in terms of community engagement so Birmingham Botanical Gardens have not had an engagement team they've not had a body of engagement practice and um, there's not been a head of engagement and learning till I came along so actually we had to reframe that and there were many connections relationships to inherit but actually they weren't coherent and we weren't known for this body of work and actually our ethics and values and philosophy behind our community engagement that just wasn't aligned and we had no vocabulary around that so to, we then completely had to reframe the ask of communities because we haven't earned our stripes in that space. So how can we be going out saying we want you to do X, Y and Z, please? Actually, no, the ask wasn't appropriate. So reshaping and, and it, going back to the question around the future, you know, this is such early days for the gardens. And as I say, I was very had a lot of gratitude that we could reshape the project to fit that context. But um, it seems that there is much mileage in terms of what we learn from year one and if we want to do something in the future, because it is, as I say, very early days. Then do you want to say a bit more about how you've been starting to build relationships with the communities at BBG? Yeah, I can do. Thanks, Kat. Um, yeah, so my role is funded by that stage one lottery grant. And, and as I said, that there has not been that team or that resource or that strategy behind community engagement before at the gardens. It's not to say it wasn't happening. It was happening ad hoc. Sometimes it was happening secretly. So I'd be there like a few months and find out a group had been using the garden every week and I didn't know. Um, so it was just there's been a process of actually finding those connections and activities to inherit and actually just finding out what what is already happening and, and putting some form to that. And then um, just in terms of hyper local community organisations, we're working to what does a 20 minute walk time look like or a one mile radius around the garden and using that just as a form by which to try and align things like audience data, audience development and me getting out on the ground and finding out who are those people in our hyper local communities and um, that's been lots of getting out lots of cups of teas lots of chats which is quite wonderful sometimes finding out that these near neighbors are already using the gardens and we didn't know sometimes finding out that they felt like the gardens weren't for them and they've never used the gardens. So actually then it's just having that conversation around, well, at this stage, it's just opening the door. What can we do to enable access, particularly the pay barrier? It is a barrier. So actually mechanisms by which to navigate the pay barrier for community organisations have been really key. Um, so starting that and then actually reaching out to others in the city beyond that 20 minute walk time as well so not to be exclusive about that and um in six months just building up a contact book and a collection of lovely warm friends of the gardens actually and friends with a small f um who can actually now utilize the gardens more readily than they might have done even sort of six nine months ago um, and that's that very early stage and, and it's the importance of meeting people on their terms and where they're at and it is labor intensive so getting out and, and meeting people I was at an organization this afternoon having a cup of tea saying hello just meeting them on their terms on their patch um, so I think just honoring that it, it takes a lot of time and energy to do that. And we, as I say, we're at the very early stages. And then some of those, as I say, they're now using the gardens in a different way. Um, so it's activating that relationship. And for example, some of them, we've just partnered on a, a funding application we've put together. So three community organisations who we had no connection with six, nine months ago, and now on partnering on that community engagement fund application that we've just put in, which is West Midlands Combined Authority funding linked to the Commonwealth Games. Um, so, yeah, it's early days, but that we're starting to see these relationships develop and how it can benefit um, the gardens and, and each other in an equitable way. Thanks, Jen. Um, I see it's 
Um, eight o'clock, so we are at the end of the session. Um, maybe does have does anyone have some final thoughts or comments? I suppose so. I, I was reading a paper by Jin um, from two thousand and nine about Christchurch Botanical Gardens and thinking about reframing the gardens as kind of vulnerable spaces that need protecting um, for their own survival. And I suppose that that's my kind of final thought is whatever we do in these spaces, it's 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 about moving that narrative from perhaps what it has been in it and and linking its post-coloniality to actually this may be about survival you know we're in a really critical period for the arts and for heritage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and 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 thinking about it in maybe a slightly different way in that way yeah i think for me the learning so far has been really about space and actually we at those first conversations we went back and, and just gave this project a lot of space and we had the luxury to be able to do that. And, and as we said, it's not necessarily outcome driven in a, in a formal sense. And I've really appreciated that space to, to learn and, and both give people space to find out what they're interested in and, and lead the way. And for us to have space to think and shape this in the way that's most appropriate for the context we're in right now. Yeah, I think that has been really nice about the project that there isn't that pressure to, you know, find so find something out um, or present like something at the end. So it's more in a way that we can see what works and what doesn't work. But it's yeah, it's very low stakes in that sense. It's just about building those relationships and um, finding out what people want really. Yeah, and that's the crucial difference between knowledge exchange and and the research as such isn't it you know however problematic and difficult our ethics form has been because of that <laughs> yeah. with the we're not, we're not researching we don't we, 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 we want to exchange knowledge you know it's a, a genuine relationship building um all right so i just want to say thanks again um for everyone asserted jen um emily and charlie for joining me today and thanks to alex and the rest of the bonington team and the post-colonial and global studies research group. Um, if you, um, there are details um, on the Bonnington website on how to get in touch with us. Um, and if you want to see the talk again um, or forward it to anyone you know. Um, our last event will be next, oh, our last event will be um, next week um, on the 7th of March where um, Claire Radelman and Sophie Fuggle will explore how plants can become aligned with human ideas about time, um, seasons and cycles. Um, so thank you everyone and I hope you all enjoy your evening. <laughs>